multiple marriages, fired from a film studio, heartbreaking final performances. Garland longed for peace and stability, but her life inside the relentless Hollywood machine was more like a terrifying roller coaster. Judy Garland was born Frances Ethel Gum on June 10, 1922. Her parents, Ethel Milne and Frank Gum, already had two children, Mary Jane and Virginia, and didn't want another. Ethel considered abortion, but due to the risk and the fact that abortion was illegal, they decided to have the baby. Rumor had it that Frank was involved in affairs with men around the time Ethel became pregnant with her youngest, and the talk got so out of hand that the family moved from Grand Rapids, Minnesota to California in 1926. The move didn't do much to fix the Gums' marriage. Garland later recalled, My parents were separating and getting back together all the time. It was very hard for me to understand those things, and, of course, I remember clearly the fear I had of those separations. However, what the move to the Golden State did do was jumpstart Judy's career. The actor signed with MGM in 1935, the same year her father died of meningitis. Ethel remarried four years later, on the anniversary of Frank's death, no less, and her relationship with Judy became even more strained afterward. Not to mention the actor's disdain for her new stepfather. Judy Garland didn't live long, 47 years to be exact, yet she spent 43 of those years on stage, all due to her mother's insistence. It turns out Garland's mother, Ethel Milne Gum, was quite the stage mom, having been a vaudeville performer herself. She was very jealous because she had absolutely no talent. In an interview with Barbara Walters, Garland explained that she had no choice about whether to become a performer, saying, She would sort of stand in the wings when I was a little girl, and if I didn't feel good or I was sick to my tummy, she would say, You get out and sing or I'll wrap you around the bedpost and break you off short. Sadly, Gum's compulsion to make her daughter a star only isolated Judy from her peers. She didn't have many friends, as show people were, at the time, considered outcasts. Garland confessed that, The only time I felt wanted when I was a kid was when I was on a stage, performing. The pressure to become a performer weighed heavily on Judy Garland from the time she was a little girl. How old were you when you got your first job? 30 months. Her mother thrust her in the spotlight when she was still a toddler, and things didn't get better when the young star was taken under MGM's wing in 1935. She was on set six days a week, sometimes 72 hours at a time. How was Garland able to perform under such a demanding schedule? Drugs. During Hollywood's golden age, the studios fed their stars pep pills to keep them going, followed by a different set of drugs to help them sleep. Poppies. Poppies will put them to sleep. Sleep. By the time she was 17 and filming of The Wizard of Oz was complete, she was addicted to barbiturates and amphetamines. Garland once shared her disturbing schedule, noting that while filming, she was required to take these pep pills and would then be given sleeping pills that would knock her out for four hours, only to be awakened again with even more drugs to resume shooting. As she recalled, that's the way we got mixed up. After signing with MGM in 1935, Judy Garland was set for her first film, Pigskin Parade, the following year. She was only 14. To make sure she was camera ready, studio head Louis B. Mayer demanded Garland's diet consist of chicken soup, black coffee, and cigarettes, along with pills to reduce her appetite. As detailed in Get Happy, The Life of Judy Garland, after Pigskin Parade was released, Garland called herself a fat little frightening pig with pigtails, an image of herself she surely developed thanks to MGM. Mayer referred to his A-lister as My Little Hunchback, a joke Garland often repeated herself. And at one point, the New York Post even began calling the actor Plump Judy Garland. Garland has said that above anything else in her childhood, the constant struggle regarding food was what she remembered the most. Sadly, Garland's body image issues followed her into adulthood. As her third husband, Sid Luft, recalled in his book, Judy and I, she never gave up her obsessive desire to be camera slim, even if it meant using dangerous methods. Growing up under MGM's wing was a far cry from the typical childhood Judy Garland craved. From 1939 to 1948, Garland filmed 21 movies, all with her daily cocktails of pep pills and sleeping pills. As a result, the star's work suffered. The medications had Garland struggling to get through her lines and musical numbers. She started turning up to set late or not at all, ultimately holding up production, a bad look for MGM and one of its biggest stars. Besides being detrimental to the young actor's physical health, this routine took a toll on her mentally as well. While filming The Pirate in 1947, Garland suffered a nervous breakdown and was put in a private sanitarium. Things only got more alarming from there, and by the time she was in her mid-twenties, Garland was receiving electroshock therapy for depression. By 1950, Garland's relationship with MGM was on thin ice. 
In the middle of shooting the lead role of Annie Oakley in Annie Get Your Gun, an exhausted, overworked Garland was fired and replaced by Betty Hutton. Garland returned to the sanitarium for rest and further treatment as an annoyed Louis B. Mayer reportedly moaned, I've got millions tied up in this girl, I need her to work. After a few more onset stumbles that year, MGM Studios officially dumped Garland's contract in September 1950. There's no denying that Judy Garland lacked a normal childhood. Because of this, the legendary actor truly wished that her kids wouldn't have to go through the same traumas. She's quoted in Judy Garland on Judy Garland saying, My children are the most important things in my life. Garland had three children, Liza Minnelli in 1946, Lorna Luft in 1952, and Joey Luft in 1955. I'd like you to meet my daughter, Lorna. Pleased to meet you. And this is my son, Joe. How do you do? <laughs> Liza's out skating with her beau, but she'll be in later. Try as she might to put her children first, Garland would always be battling her own demons, something that continued until her tragic death in 1969. According to the New York Times, Minnelli was treated as an adult early on in her life, becoming her mother's source of comfort and advice by the time she was a teen. It was Manelli as well who dealt with most of the problems, too, from unpaid bills to missed appointments. You're out of breath. Well, why don't you stop? <laughs> as for Lorna and Joey, the younger siblings had to deal with their mother's dwindling source of income. Lorna told People about a troublesome incident that occurred that year. She was coming back from school to see her mother sitting on a hotel's window ledge. Her mother said, We can't pay the hotel bill, so I'm threatening to jump out the window. All three siblings thought highly of their mother, but nothing could have helped her addiction. In a 2017 interview, Joey told Closer, I was powerless. Out of all of the loves Judy Garland had in her life, none of them seemed to last. Sadly, four of the star's marriages ended in divorce, with the fifth tragically cut short due to her death. Garland's first marriage was to David Rose in 1941. It was a shock at the time. The star was only 19, while Rose was 31. Of course, MGM disapproved of the marriage, yet Garland was determined, eloping with Rose to Las Vegas. After a secret abortion and the couple's apparent inability to see eye to eye, the pair divorced in 1944. Next up was director Vincent Minnelli in 1945, a relationship Garland's studio officially approved of. In fact, it was studio head Louis B. Mayer himself who walked the blushing bride down the aisle. However, due to the star's growing mental instability, the pair parted ways in 1949 making room for her third husband, Sid Luft. Garland's marriage to Luft was to become her longest. Luft and Garland married in 1952, yet for the same reasons that drove Garland and Minnelli apart, this union also came to a close in 1965. A whirlwind romance with fourth husband, Mark Herron, happened that same year, but sadly it only lasted until 1967. Garland's final and shortest marriage was to Mickey Deans in 1969. By this time, the actor struggled with various physical and mental ailments, which ultimately led to her fatal overdose a mere three months after their wedding. It's no surprise that Judy Garland's mental health deteriorated as a result of her grueling schedule and the severe mental trauma dished out by her mother, the press, and the studio. By the time my mother was 37 years old, she had made 39 movies. That's insanity. Sadly, the star attempted suicide on numerous occasions. Garland made her first attempt in 1947 while filming the movie musical The Pirate alongside Gene Kelly. This was after the first nervous breakdown that resulted in being placed in the mental health institution. Instead of getting Garland the help she needed, her mother Ethel Milne Gum taped up the cuts from her daughter's slashed wrists and had her back on set to resume filming. More attempts followed, as detailed in her daughter Lorna Luft's biography, Me and My Shadows. Luft revealed many harrowing stories including her mother's postpartum depression, which resulted in an overdose, another attempt while in a Washington hotel room, and yet another incident where she tried throwing herself out of a hotel window. Remarkably, Luff claims that none of those closest to the actor ever believed she intentionally tried to take her own life. Honestly, I'm surprised my mom got to the age of 47. With all of the things that happened to her, just the pressure of being Judy Garland. Luft alleged that some of the events were drug reactions that Garland wouldn't remember afterward, explaining, my mother's suicide attempts were a way to release anxiety. The final years of Judy Garland's life were not filled with glitz and glamour, the sort of end you'd expect from a Hollywood legend that left such an impact on the industry. Instead, things only escalated, becoming even more heartbreaking. Garland's daughter, Lorna Luft, spoke about her mom's financial struggles in her memoir, Me and My Shadows. She notes that, thanks to agents, the IRS, no-show concerts, and old debts, Garland was completely broke. And yet, because the Wizard of Oz star was so used to a certain way of living, she had no idea what things cost or how to keep a track of her money. 
Even as eviction notices came the family's way, Garland would perform various dramatic stunts as a means to get out of seemingly desperate situations. In 1968, a year before her death, Garland embarked on a string of concerts in London, England. According to The Guardian, these shows were difficult to watch, what with the star's slurred speech and the resulting heckling from the audience. Sadly, after having been fed various forms of pills practically her entire life, Judy Garland finally died of a drug overdose on June 22, 1969. She was only 47. It was Garland's husband of three months, Mickey Deans, who discovered his wife slumped on the toilet with her hands still holding up her head. An autopsy concluded that the actor's cause of death was accidental barbiturate poisoning. According to the coroner who carried out the autopsy, Dr. Gavin Thurston, Garland also had cirrhosis of the liver, meaning that the amount of alcohol the star had been drinking would have killed her as well, had it not been for the drugs. As Thurston told the Desert Sun at the time, he firmly believed the cause of death wasn't deliberate, stating, this is quite clearly an accidental circumstance to a person who is accustomed to taking barbiturates over a very long time. However, Garland's eldest daughter, Liza Minnelli, firmly disagrees that her mother died of an overdose. In a 1972 interview with Time magazine, Minnelli said, She let her guard down. I think she just got tired. If you or anyone you know is struggling with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357.